I'm Stan Houston for the What It Takes Radio Company, and a number of years ago I made this presentation and someone said, hey, we ought to show it again, so I guess we'll do just that. So here we go, a blast from the past. And what it was was a presentation entitled The Intentional Leader, The Secret Sign, and this is Scene 2 in a Continuing Program. Welcome back. And you didn't have to come back, did you? <laughs> we decided to switch the channel. You could have left. Yeah. And you see, if I'd given a bad first show, you'd have left. That's true for everything you do. In effect, I have to keep buying the next five minutes. I do. I'm always trying to buy five minutes of your time. Because remember, if I want that five minutes, you're going to be five minutes closer to being dead. And so I'm always buying time by using the same formula, right? Attention, interest, desire, decision, and action. And the goal was that you would come back. And you did. At least, most of you did. By the way, if somebody had would decided to leave, that's okay because they have actually made a good marketing decision. They have decided, this isn't for me. Or I don't like him. You know? Remember, the purpose of marketing is to help the no's say so faster. Now, that's all. Just for them to say faster. Now, with that in mind, I want to hopefully teach you some new things, and I hope that was new to you. By the way, it is incredible that all of you have gone through many of years of education, and no one ever taught you the Ada formula. Until now. Yet it is the most important thing you need to know for business success. Every speech, every sermon, every presentation, everything you say has to attention, interest, desire, decision, action. And you didn't hear it until now. What's wrong? Well, Peter Drucker will tell you what's wrong. Years ago, this is what Peter Drucker said on Forbes magazine. This is my favorite magazine cover. Everything you've learned is wrong. <laughs> By the way, that's a good motto for life. I take it even into my faith. Jesus, you know what I've discovered in the last year? A lot of things I thought I knew about God and love and business, they were wrong. Here I am, 70 years of age. And I screwed up. A lot of what I thought was right was wrong. And I thought I had this thing down. I'm a missionary. I'm a broadcaster. I'm a smart guy. But a number of things I thought were wrong. That's okay. I'm a little bit smarter now. So please be prepared as you enter into life and in the business you are to be prepared to be delighted and surprised by new things. Just do it. The goal is to be fully alive. One of the reasons I came to Tucson is because I loved the idea of the Desert Fathers. There's a wonderful paraphrase in Hosea that says, Go into the desert and God will speak to your heart. God doesn't speak to our minds as much as He heals our hearts. Go to the desert. And then if you actually study the desert fathers and mothers, and there were desert fathers and mothers, <laughs> this idea of women having a lower status within the Christian church was not originally so. It's one that we made up along the way. And that may challenge some of you, but that's okay. <laughs> and what happened is, you know why they went into the desert? They went into the desert so that they could meet Jesus and become fully alive. And the goal is to be fully alive. 
By the way, if you're fully alive, you'll get more business. You'll attract people. It's about energy. It's about personality. In effect, I might give a book. It's all about you. You make the difference. They're not going to like this, Diana, but it's not about thriving. I got thrown out of an insurance office one time. And I'll tell you the company. My wife worked for him for 25 years. I stood in front of Northwestern Mutual Life and said, it ain't about Northwestern Mutual Life. It's about you. And the general manager informed me that that was not the message he wanted his people to hear. <laughs> it's about the company. And he said, and I, and I said, but it's not true. He says, it doesn't matter whether it's true, Stan. You're not going to say it here. By the way, that's part of the fallen business world we live and work in, right? Okay, just so we understand that. Now, uh, I'm going to teach you the second major thing you need to know. And that is, everybody you meet is wearing a secret sign. Did you know that? Everybody. Steve is wearing it. I'm wearing it. Charity's wearing it. Zveno, I love that name. You know, I love your haircut too. You know, we got to, you know, Stan, Zveno, great haircuts, you know. It's part of our shtick, you know, right? <laughs> By the way, we all have a shtick. It all depends on how well you play it. All right? And um, most people don't pay any attention to the sign. Did you? Did you know we have a, everyone has a sign? Do you know what the sign says? Well, I'm going to tell you what it says. Did you know that? That's the sign they're wearing. Well, why don't you do that? Now you say, Stan, I, I get but we do. No, no. All of you have had sales training in some form or another. I guarantee it. And here's what they taught you. Hey, my name is Stan and I represent the coaching experience company. And I'd like to just get together. And can you give me 20 minutes of your time? And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I do and see if it could be helpful to you. Can we set a time? How about Wednesday or Thursday at this time? <laughs> right? Set the appointment. Okay, then you get them in there. You pull out your brochures. You pull out your dead trees. And you start talking about you and your company and what you do. You didn't read the sign! <laughs> Did you? Now that sales training, and by the way, even that marketing is taught all around the world. It's a lie. Because they're not reading the sign. Don't do that. Now, I'll illustrate it even further. Let's assume that I would have used typical sales language when I met this cute little girl named Karen. 49 years ago, 50 years ago. It's hard to believe. As we say, you know, opposites attract, they also attack. <laughs> and we're very opposite. So, you know, as we say, we never celebrate in advance. Hopefully we'll make it. You know. Okay. And what if I would have done this? I call her up and say, hey, Karen, this is Stan. And we met. You know, it was her, there's a long story behind that, which I wouldn't go into. But there's always a wonderful story behind every relationship. There is. You know. 
I was broke, didn't have any money. So I went, so I went home to her brother's house so we could eat, and I met his sister. <laughs> okay, what if I the Karen? And we go down to a little restaurant in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and this is so many years ago. You know, obviously, you know, um, spaghetti and meatballs is $1.25. You know, if you want extra meatball, you have to pay an extra quarter. You know, you can get a glass of wine for 50 cents, you know, and I'm poor, but we went there. And let's say, right after I sit down, I say, Karen, it is so nice to be out together. Karen, I'd like to spend the next half hour talking about me. Wouldn't that be a great idea? Wouldn't that be great? How do you think that's going to go over with Karen? That's how you were taught to sell. I'd like to spend the next 20 minutes talking about me and how wonderful I am and how good I am. And the whole time, Karen is showing me the sign and I'm just not paying any attention to it. Now, let's say I survive that and I'm taking her back to the dormitory the University of Minnesota, and I'm walking her up. So it's first date, and I'm a gentleman, so I don't try anything untoward, you know. However, I bring her up to the dormitory, and then I say, Karen, you know I've had a wonderful time, and obviously, Karen, you know that I really like girls. So Karen, perhaps there's some other girls in the dormitory you can suggest that I call on. <laughs> I'm asking for referrals! <laughs> Aren't I? Weren't you taught to ask for referrals? <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Who else do you know that I could call on? And you're all laughing, and all of your bosses taught you to sell that way. Didn't they? No, well, that's different. What I've just told Karen is this whole encounter is about me. It's all about me. <clears throat> I want to talk about me, I want you to give me money, and then I want you to help me build my business. Because you know what, Karen? It's all about me. What does the sign say? Please. Tell me I'm important. Now, let me ask you a question. How can you do that? Asking them questions. Oh. Now, did you notice, as I said, I gave my first lesson, I did not ask you what you did or where you were from. I said, Please tell me your story. Sometimes I have to encourage people to do it because they aren't used to being asked their story. And they say, well, I don't have a story. Guess what I say? Everybody has a story. Where did you grow up? Two years ago, there was a man uh, I met at a party, but I met him via his wife. He was sitting there, and she said, that's my husband. He said, he just recently had a stroke, and so he's kind of quiet right now. I said, oh. I went over, sat down, got right next to him, say hi. My name is Stan, and uh, you're married to Joanne. I said, yeah. I said what's your name? Tell me your story. He says, oh, I don't have a story. Oh, yeah, you do. Everybody has a story. Where did you grow up? <clears throat> Forty minutes later, <laughs> found out that he had been drafted in World War I, two, World War II, was a tail gunner in a B-17 flying over Europe. And by the way, if you know anything about the B-17, they were always kids who were the tail gunners. 
because a full-grown man wouldn't fit. So there were young kids sitting out there, and they had to go back to get their parachute if they were there. They couldn't wear their parachute. He said, every time we went out, he said, I went out on 100 missions. He said, every time I came back, I had friends who were dead. Every time. He said, we always wondered who died. Coming back. He said, did that very, very, very hard, very, very hard. Came back, but we were poor, so I went on, got the GI Bill, and I went to the University of Chicago. Wow, kid from Kansas going to the University of Chicago. I studied under a guy named Milton Friedman. <laughs> and eventually, I, you know, I, Sears Roebuck asked me, and uh, I had a good career there, and I, then I landed up running their philanthropy department and working in charity and philanthropy all around the world. And he started telling me stories about that. But what did he say first? I don't have a story. But he did have a story. And you know what he said to me afterwards? Tears started coming down his eye. Said, Thank you, because you know what? No one listens to me anymore. No one listens to me anymore. He's just the guy with the stroke. Am I beginning to get across to you <laughs> that this might be a very, very important business strategy <clears throat> to begin to say, I have to, first of all, have my story real strong, but I get it done with in how long? One minute. <laughs> and then I spend most of my time doing what? Paying attention to the sign. You think that might just be a little strategy we could think about? Now, what I would particularly ask you to do is thinking in terms of that. Again, that was one strategy. Are there other ways that we could do that? Are there any other ways that we could tell people they're important? This is one of the ways I use. Uh, I like to make pens. For fun. By the way, there's a theology behind that because I spent most of my life marketing, messaging, and doing things like that. Managing marketing and messaging. Unfortunately, I am not living a biblical lifestyle that way. Because God made us to make things. Did you know that? We were made to be creators of things. And all of a sudden, I realized that I had spent all of my life marketing, messaging, and managing, and I had never done any make. And I can't make anything. I'm a klutz. <laughs> and I discovered that if I truly want to live biblically, I have to have something, like Saint Paul says, I will actually make something. Uh, Saint Paul was a businessman. Did you know that? Now, a lot of people get that all screwed up. They think that whenever he was short of money, he went out and made a few tents. No. I have a whole talk on St. Paul Entrepreneur. St. Paul was able to do missionary work because he was, first of all, a businessman. How do you think he became a Roman citizen? Because the Romans liked Christian missionaries? No, he was a businessman. By the way, he couldn't work for anybody else. You know what kind of person he is. And as I say, you know, being a businessman is the only way you can make money while you're still in jail. <laughs> Which is what he did. And so for years, we in the church have put the fact that a person is a businessman at a lower level. St. Paul was a businessman. By the way, I've got another talk called The Four Secrets of Success You Can Learn from St. Paul's Prison Letter. But that's another talk, and you're going to have to pay for that one. <laughs> All right? But the secret of success is found in St. Paul's letter from jail. But you want me to give you that one, you got to buy it. Fair enough? All right. There's a little sales pitch for you. 
Okay, now, uh, I make these. I love it. Now, I'm not going to do it now because I promised this to someone else. But oftentimes, what I'll simply say is, you know, oh, that's a nice pen. I say, I make it. I make these. I describe why I make it. Then I use the magic words. Kathy, this is for you. This is for you. Now, I learned that as a broadcaster, because I was really good. did late night radio. <clears throat> I was really good at it. By the way, you had to be careful, because you know what? I found out the Ada formula. If you're not very ethical, you can sell Jesus as well as you can sell soap. <laughs> Are you lonesome tonight? <laughs> Would you like someone who sticks closer than a brother? In fact, what drove me crazy one time is I found out that that marketing formula was being used by Christians that actually try and sell Jesus. And I said, we ain't going to sell Jesus the way we sell soap. We can sell soap and stuff. We're not going to do that. That's a different thing. There's a theology of communication. But that's another show which you'll have to pay for. All right? So, but I did learn this. We'd get requests. People say. And uh, I would oftentimes pause. Remember, it's late night. To change the tone. And tonight we have a request from Barbara, who lives in Kingston, Jamaica. Barbara, thank you for listening. I'm so glad to know you're out there. Barbara would like us to play One Day at a Time by Tennessee Ernie Ford. Oh, they love that song. <laughs> by the way, I found out there's a reason why they like One Day at a Time. Because that was their experience. Unlike those of us in the West who don't have to worry about where we're going to eat tomorrow. One day at a time was their deal. I'd say, okay, this song is requested by Barbara in Kingston, Jamaica. She wants to hear One Day at a Time by Tennessee Ernie Ford. And then I would pause and I would say, Barbara, this is for you. This is for you. I taught, I taught insurance people. <laughs> it was so simple. You're going to deliver an insurance policy, and so they give you this cheap plastic wrapper that has the company name on it. All right? Take it out. Go down. Get a nice little leather binder. Put it in there, get a little engraving with their name on it, and then when you present the insurance policy, you would say, Diana, this is for you. Wow. You had it engraved just for me. Think about that. Now, this all comes from a deeper principle which I learned a number of years ago. And it's very simple, but I don't know if I practice it. One of my mentors was a broadcaster. Never met him, but I loved him. His name was Earl Nightingale. Had this great, wonderful voice. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he had a wonderful story too, which I could tell you later on. But uh, you know, part of his voice came from the fact that he had learned to smoke in the Second World War and he went through three packs of camels every day, which does something for the voice <laughs> and for other parts of your anatomy. So he didn't live a long life. That was sad. But he actually had this experience. He was on the USS Arizona on December 7th, 1941, as a young 18-year-old Marine. And he got blown into the water and survived. And he said, you know what happened? I realized I should be dead. So every day that I had was a gift. What is there to lose? What can they do to me? I should be dead. Isn't that a great lesson to finally put? I should be dead. I have a friend, a lawyer a friend of mine, we actually worked out this marketing slogan. People came in and said, okay, they wanted to sue people. And they said, oh, well, 
what are you hoping for? Well, it's just, I just want to get what I deserve. And our line was, oh, no, you don't. You don't want what you deserve. <laughs> if you got what you deserve, you'd be in big trouble. <laughs> We're going to ask the question, what do you want? <laughs> Not what you deserve. So you deserve to die. Did you know that? Check your theology. You don't even deserve to be here. You should be dead. You know that. You should be dead, right? Absolutely. There's so many things. You should be dead. But you're not. Grace is amazing. Earl Nightingale said this. He said, if you want to be successful in life, you have to understand that you're successful in life is because you treat every person you meet as if they were the most important person in the world. Treat every person you meet as if they were the most important person in the world. A few years ago, one of the companies I had was told that President Bush might be coming through from the landing in the Minneapolis airport and coming through, <clears throat> and he was probably going to stop at their office, little insurance office. And so, guess what they all did? Whoa! <laughs> They cleaned up the office. They got it all arranged and made it all pretty and took all the dumb stuff off. And they all got dressed up. But the schedule didn't work out. President Bush didn't stop. And they were so disappointed. And I said, no, President Bush didn't stop here. Just your clients and customers stop here. <laughs> That's all. The, the only people who come here are the clients and customers. Do we dress up for them? Hell no. Do we treat them as good as we treat George Bush? No. Treat every person you meet as if they were the most important person in the world. Now, I want you to begin thinking about that. As you walk out, see the receptionist, you know, person at the car wash, Everybody you meet, just say, I wonder what I would do. How would I respond if I really believed this was the most important person in the world? Would I respond any differently than I am? And you know why you should treat them as the most important person in the world? Because they are. Because they are. And by the way, so are you. The Lord Jesus died for you. And what I finally understood, that if the story went this way, that the great eternal heavenly thing would say this, is, hey, it worked out perfectly. Everybody got it right except Stan Houston, that one character in the 20th, 21st century, he screwed up. And if that would have happened, the Lord Jesus would have stepped forward and said, I got to die for Stan. And he would have done the same thing for you because you're the most important person in the world. And so in life and business, you treat everybody you meet the same way Jesus would treat them as the most important person in the world. And thank you for watching our Just More Than a Few Years Ago program. But we still believe that we have some very good things that can help you on the same subjects, the same idea, and perhaps with a, a little more wisdom and experience in our own life. So again, reach out to us, stanhousted at gmail.com, stanhousted at gmail.com. Check out our YouTube channel, Reaching Your Audience. How to be a world-class podcaster. And uh, leave a message, 520-664-7002, and we'll be happy to uh, get back to you. All the best and blessings to you, and this is brought to you by the What It Takes Radio Company.